good evening, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Philomena Murray, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the CONREP public, public event on narratives. Um, first of all, however, I would like to um, acknowledge that um, acknowledge the elders and descendants of the Wurundjeri people, where some of us are meeting, and other Aboriginal Indigenous people who have been and are the coast custodians of these lands. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet was the place of age-old ceremonies, of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the local Indigenous peoples have had and continue to have a unique role in the life of these lands. Thank you for joining us today. You are here as part of an event that is a, a CONREP event that is from the Comparative Network on Refugee Externalization Policies. It's an international interdisciplinary network of scholars from seven universities throughout Australia and Europe. What we look at in particular is the externalization of refugee policies in two regions in particular, in Asia and in the Pacific and the European Union and its member states activities, including particularly in North Africa. We're very concerned about studying and writing about power asymmetries to transfer state and regional obligations and responsibility for asylum seekers and refugees to reluctant, often neighboring states. At their most destructive, externalization policies can prevent refugees from reaching safety and breach their human rights. What we are seeing is an avoidance of legal and political responsibility where many states violate their legal obligations. Externalization deflects responsibility, transforming the governance of refugee protection and border control. Regional cooperation for refugee protection is weakened and human rights protections are undermined. At the global level, migration pathways are disrupted and refugees are often caught in transit, placing them at risk. Nationally, some governments seek to gain electoral advantage by being tough on border protection. Tough is in inverted commas. The accelerating phenomenon of externalization characterizing these so-called tough border protection policies requires we consider a comprehensive analysis by researchers, civil society actors, refugees, and policymakers. CONREP is funded by the European Union under the Erasmus Plus program as a Jean Monnet activity, as a Jean Monnet network. The network um, partners of CONREP are the University of Melbourne, which is the lead university, Deakin University, Monash University, the University of Bologna, University of Geneva, University of Gothenburg, and Western Sydney University. The European Union funds this, but it would not be possible without the support from the University of Melbourne. And we are so pleased that the University Centrally, the Faculty of Arts and the School of Social and Political Sciences, um, where this um, administration and management and direction is based, have all supported us financially. Um, so we would like to acknowledge publicly the support that we get there and indeed other support from other um, uh, contributing and participating um, universities. Um, today, I would like to remind you that this event is being recorded, and this is an event that is very, very topical and unfortunately extremely um, challenging. We are looking at the perceptions and narratives of refugees, we're looking at the media and beyond. And so in this public forum, which not only is being recorded, but will be made available on the CONREP website, um, we are bringing together a panel of specialists from a number of perspectives who are going to talk about how the media reports on externalization policies. We are going to talk about the sort of perceptions and narratives of people seeking protection, people seeking um, asylum. The forum is also considering today the influences and sh what shapes narratives on refugees as a humanitarian concern or as a security issue, for example. We also consider it extremely important to hear the stories of people seeking asylum, people who have been refugees of refugee experience as well. So it gives me great pleasure um, to welcome you to this event. Um, it is not a complete pleasure, however, because these are really challenging issues. And so while we are very lucky um, to have such fantastic people speaking uh, with us today and joining us, and we look forward to your questions in the chat function later, 
nevertheless, these are all issues of considerable concern. And we thank you for joining us in sharing our concern and hearing about perspectives on narratives from a number of perspectives. I'm, it is now my great pleasure to introduce the Reverend Professor Russell Goldburn. He is the um, Dean of Arts at the University of Melbourne and has been since January 2019. He studied at Keble College where he uh, obtained his um, bachelor's, his master's and his DPhil at the University of Ox Oxford. He taught at the Department of French at the University of Leeds, followed first as a lecturer, senior lecturer, and then as a professor in early modern French literature. He has been head of department there and he then moved to King's College London as professor of French literature in 2013, where he also became Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's. He joined us um, in early 2019 and is a supporter of our CONREP network. I would like now to introduce um, our Dean and to ask you, Professor Goldburn, if you would like to now um, formally welcome us to the, this important event. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Philo, and uh, thank you to the network, the Comparative Network on uh, Refugee Externalization Policies, CONREP, for, for convening this event. Uh, as Philo has just said, um, an important, um, difficult, uh, challenging uh, set of topics to be talking about, but, but really important. Um, it is then so an honour and a pleasure for me to be introducing this, this forum. Um, at the risk of understatement, it is of course a timely gathering. Um, I know that none of the issues explored by CONREP is, is ever purely abstract or, or theoretical, but I think as a community, of course, we are particularly mindful at the moment of the, the reality, the lived reality uh, of the situation of refugees. We're particularly mindful of those uh, more than five, five and a half million Ukrainians who fled their country since the conflict began, in addition to the estimated more than 26 million refugees around the world. We, we, we know how, uh, how real these issues are and how pressing they are. Um, so this is timely, it's, it's an, a really important event. Um, Thinking of time, I'm conscious that this forum is, is just one of many events that uh, the network has organized in, in a range of locations over the last four years, um, and in particular in the last couple of years, um, events organized um, online. Um, and I know that those events have ranged from academic workshops to meetings with policymakers, civil society, conferences, public forums, and, and much more besides. Um, and I know we are mindful of the limitations um, of, of the online platforms that we can use, but there are some benefits too. And if those benefits mean that we reach further um, and that we draw in more deeply uh, into these kind of events, then they are, they are great benefits. And I'm glad that in today's forum, we're drawing on some of that, that expertise that we've developed over the last couple of years. Um, and in opening up this forum um, and, and all of the, the discussion that will, will follow today. Uh, as Dean of the Arts Faculty here at Melbourne, I'm acutely aware of the importance of um, publicly facing, publicly engaged research across the humanities and social sciences. Um, here in the Arts Faculty at Melbourne, we talk about being committed to benefiting the people's cultures and uh, economies of, of Melbourne, Australia, the region, the world, by the work that we do. And the work that we do is, is all about sharing, um, creating, transforming, sharing knowledge that deepens our understanding of what it means to be human. Um, and of course, the work that CONREP does goes to the very heart of that. It exemplifies the mission of this faculty, if you like. Um, I'm particularly struck by the fact that CONREP's work is situated at the intersection, the nexus of, of research and, and public policy, and therefore public benefit. Um, CONREP was born out of a concern about, as, as Philo was saying a moment ago, about the harmful impact um, of contemporary border protection policies, which externalize or, or transfer responsibility for refugee protection. Um, away from states that are signatory to the Refugee Convention. Addressing those concerns head on is also at the heart of what this faculty of which I'm Dean um, really values. 
uh, we commit ourselves in terms of our, 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 our ethical principles, we commit ourselves to social justice and civic responsibility. Once again, Conrep's work, this forum today, uh, exemplifies what matters to us and how we do our work as, as a faculty. We're committed as a faculty to doing research that makes a difference, that makes a difference to people's lives um, and to our understanding of other people's lives as well. We're committed to working in partnership uh, with others far beyond this, this faculty, far beyond this university as well, um, and in developing local, national, regional, uh, and global collaborations. And once again, the uh, CONREP embodies that commitment that we have to working locally, globally, um, to being uh, leaders, not just in thinking, but in practice as well, in policy and in practice, addressing matters of national and global uh, importance. So I'm really impressed by and, and deeply grateful for um, the work that CONREP has been doing, the partnerships that it has forged, the research that CONREP has been doing, focusing on matters of, of, of real and pressing global concern. Um, I'm really grateful for the work that CONREP has do, been doing with students in particular, uh, through the masterclasses, through opportunities for PhD students, amongst others, to, to contribute to this project and to have their work profiled um, as part of uh, the network's um, activity. And of course, preparing uh, and enabling future generations of people who understand um, and will help, uh, help us to get to grips with, with issues. The, the, the network is, as Philo was saying, genuinely interdisciplinary. Uh, and I find that so impressive that we've got team members here from a whole range of disciplines, from political science, law, criminology, sociology, uh, and more besides. The diversity uh, of the, the voices that are present um, is, is also really impressive. I know that the network has already been prolific um, and deeply impactful in the work that it has been doing, the kind of outputs that it's had, scholarly outputs, um, policy reports, media commentary, um, a blog series, and, and much more again besides. And I know that the website is um, a fantastic uh, resource for showing what, what has been done. As I said, I just want to um, acknowledge again that that importance of not just interdisciplinarity, but diversity and, and inclusion in everything that this network does. Um, I'm really impressed by the range of voices, the range of experiences that the network has brought together. Um, it is uh, uh, so powerful that one of the network's priorities has been to ensure that the voices of those with lived experience, um, that those voices are heard uh, and understood and that we learn from those voices, that we learn from those who have uh, refugee background, and refugee experience. Um, I think we're particularly honored today to have with us two speakers who bring that, precisely that lived experience and from whom we're gonna be uh, hearing just in a, in a moment. Um, so Moz uh, Azimi Taba and Alaji Jinkan. So finally, let me just say that I am um, so delighted and, and, and honored that um, Conrep is housed within this faculty uh, here at Melbourne of which I'm proud to be Dean. Um, I want to acknowledge again, the, the value of this project the importance of the project, the contribution that it's making to research on issues of global concern. And of course, I also acknowledge the contributions made uh, by all of the partners who are part of this, this network. I want to acknowledge the, uh, the European Union, of course, under the Erasmus Plus program, the, the Jean Monnet ac activities uh, or under that umbrella, um, and also the other universities. Um, in addition to Melbourne here in Australia, the Deakin, Monash and Western Sydney, and university partners in Europe as well, Geneva, Bologna, and Gothenburg. Um, it's great to have this, this, this network that's come together. Um, and it's great to have you, all of you, present at this forum today. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your commitment to this forum um, and for contributing today, as Philo said a moment ago, difficult topic, but a, a topic in which we uh, simply must engage. So I wish you well for the rest of the forum. I look forward to hearing uh, the contributions that are to come now. I'll hand back to uh, my colleague, Professor Murray, to chair the event.
Thank you very much, Professor Goldbrenn. Um, it's an absolute honor to have you um, introduce this and to provide the context for those listening, as well as for our speakers. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to um, introduce um, the panel session and just to save time, I will introduce all of the speakers at once and then we will move from one to the other uh, in, in following order. Um, so doc, doc, um, Dr. Alaji Jinkong is a research fellow at the Department of Psychology at the University of Bologna since um, 2021, since August. He's a researcher in the Horizon 2020 EU funded project, Perceptions, and he is particularly interested in human rights and immigration law, humanitarian aid organizations, dignified work and exploitation in the workplace, social issues and border management and migration, labor rights um, of um, transnational cooperations, and uh, African and Afro-American studies, journalism and media migration, and West African migrations and remittances. Uh, Sara Kreta, uh, Dr. Kreta is a photojournalist and documentary filmmaker with extensive experience in investigating human rights abuses, where she has uh, documented underground conditions and forced migration situations, human rights violations, crisis management and cultures in tradition. Her, her recent body of work includes um, uh, in Libya, Libya, No Escape from Hell, a documentary by Arte filmed in Libya at the detention of the detention systems and the role of the militias. A joint investigation by Lauthouse Reports, Der Spiegel, ARD, Liberation e Il Domani, on the role played by Frontex air surveillance assets in the intercepting and returning of asylum seekers to Libya. And she also has been has written and been involved in the ship that stopped 7,000 migrants and sm smuggled 700,000 cigarettes for the New York Times. Um, she has also filmed a documentary for Arte on women's stories from the front line of Sudan's revolution. Her work has appeared on Al Jazeera English, RTE in Ireland, Arte, NRK, ZZ, 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 ZZ um, F, um, Middle East and I, Euronews, and the New Humanitarian, among others. Um, Moz, as he likes to be called, Mostafa An An Zimitibar, is a Kurdish refugee. He fled, fled persecution in Iran. He sought refugee protection in Australia. He arrived by boat on Christmas Island and was sent to Manus Island offshore processing center in 2013. There he remained until late 2019, when he was evacuated under the Medivac laws and was locked up in the Mantra Bell Hotel detention for 13 months and in the Park Ridges Hotel for two months. Moz is now living and working in Sydney. Moz is an artist. Moz is a musician. He has entered his self-portrait in the running for the Archibald Prize, an act which challenges negative perceptions of those from a refugee background. Ben Doherty is the international affairs correspondent for the Guardian newspaper, and he has spent a decade reporting across the Asia Pacific, including in Southeast Asia and South Asia. He has won Australia's highest media award. The Journalism honored the Walkley Award, not once, not twice, but three times, as well as three United Nations Association's Media Peace Prizes. He has master's degrees in international law and international relations from the University of Oxford and from the University of New South Wales. He is the author of the novel, Nagaland, a love story for modern India. We will also have a discussant for our wonderful speakers, and that's um, Professor Pierluigi Muzaro. Pierluigi is Professor of Sociology, Culture and Communication at the Department of Sociology and Business Law at the University of Bologna. He's an honorary professor at the University of Melbourne and honorary research fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science and at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University and Monash University. He has written several books and papers on media and migration, borders and human rights, performing arts and active citizenship. He is president of the Italian NGO Yoda and uh, founding direction, director of Itaca, Migrants and Travelers Festival of Responsible Tourism and a founding member of the Italian Network Against Hate Speech. Friends and colleagues, we have a fantastic lineup of people who are going to be looking at the messages, the narratives, what exactly is being said to from about by refugees. 
I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Alaji Jinkong. And you now have the floor for 10 minutes, exactly. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I am happy myself to be here today with all of you. And I will go directly with my presentation. I will set my time. And yeah, so I, I am really impressed by the questions that were set. I think these are the topical questions that address our, our mission today. And for this reason, I would like to present the, the perceptions project because I think uh, tackle similar questions that have been said today. Going forward, my presentation outline will be will be I will present uh, the overall objective of the perceptions project, and then I will try to tackle question two of this uh, seminar which is how to efficiently communicate alternative narratives. And then I will see, uh, share the overview of some of the project outcomes until now. So going forward, the perception projects uh, sets out to understand the impact of novel technologies, social media and perceptions in countries abroad on migration flows and the security of the EU and then to provide validated counter approaches, tools, and perspectives. So I think this is basically what we are looking for today. Which objectives are first to identify narratives, images, and perceptions of Europe abroad to investigate how different narratives could lead to problems, skewed expectations, threats to migrants, and to the host countries or to the EU in general. And how do we create toolkits uh, and innovative measures to react or counteract some of these uh, uh, threats or problems, challenges uh, that consider social, societal, and structural aspects? So this was done through research uh, with migrants or stakeholders, CSOs who are considered as first-line practitioners, policy makers, law enforcement authorities, and the media to understand and then analyze and then design um, methods and tools in which uh, we also leverage on using our web platform, which uh, these tools we are later, will be validated by these practitioners and interested stakeholders, and then will be disseminated again through various uh, methods to reach the expected outcomes and uh, audiences. So, the first outcome is the, is the crystal. This is a search engine in which all the results are, 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 are categorized, organized for the end users who are migrants or first line practitioners, policy makers, which is made in a simple and clear way in which uh, these uh, outputs are arranged so that they reach their impact uh, to the to the to the audiences and the next one is uh, the best practice library whereby we collect a lot of other practices in the world because we are always as human being attracted to the new but already there is a lot in the world there is a lot uh, that we have there so we try to basically qualify some of or validate some of these practices that are up there based on their impact based on which protections of human being uh, human rights these these practices do or based on transferability, how a practice from Italy could be transferred to Australia, and how could it be sustainable in those areas as well. So also the transsectoral uh, coordination of these practices. These are some of the five qualities on which we base the selection of our practices on. You also have a user-friendly handbook that is like the crystal uh, shared into three or categorized in three methods, whether one wants to inform him or herself, wants to engage with the community or wants to influence policy makers because this is the scope in the uh, of our research in the migration ecosystem how we can reach all these important stakeholders to, to to change paradigm and then we also have an open hub 
which is uh, which is going to show the, the creative awareness materials, creative awareness materials that use as Mustafa is doing artistic the display exhibition of all the alternative narratives that can easily get in because not all of us are readers of academic literature or other products. So these are all after all all these pro, uh, outputs are structured in a database that is accessible to the public. So some of the efficient ways of alternative narratives could be communicated. I select in uh, one of these ways to be policy briefs because uh, when a policy brief is written in a smarter way, in simple, uh, clear, and precise English, this can reach policy makers who don't have time to read academic uh, uh, publications and do not have time as well. To, 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 to follow the, the, the difficult language and to go and find out everything. But in a very simple, brief, and smart way, policy briefs are a smart way to get into policy makers. And it is important that we get to policy makers because they are the people who actually have a lot of impact on what we are researching or to implement it. So in that way also, I would use uh, one creative material that Professor Muzaro is aware of is the red carpet. From the research that we did in the in the in the perception project with migrants, with uh, CSOs, with uh, NGOs, with police uh, border police, with policy makers through individual interviews and focus group, we have selected among these resources the result, uh, and then these results we are given to artists who interpret them and create some toll codes. And these QR codes lead you to a video in which these narratives are displayed from 30 to 90 seconds. And uh, they actually artistically present something that is difficult to present in an academic way and easily consumable. Uh, so how do we present a policy brief recommendation in a smart and uh, way that policymakers could uh, I think recommendations are a way to, 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 to get to policymakers in a very fast way, but also in a, in, a, in a convenient way, in a nice way. For example, this is a policy brief that is recommending how to improve uh, migration crisis management in Europe. For example, we said there is an increased need because this, this was done with first-line practitioners. Why do I choose this policy brief language? Because first-line practitioners are the gatekeepers of integration and inclusion so therefore concentrating on improving living and working condition of practitioners will definitely trickle down to the um, provision of better service for, my, uh, for migrants and also because policy uh, uh, cs uh, uh, first line practitioners have both perspectives they are in direct contact with migrants and they know the past perceptions of migrants with, with the, through this direct contact, but also their service is also to improve the living condition of migrants. For that reason, also uh, first-line practitioners are saying that there should be less externalization of European borders, but that is a nice way of saying it. What we are talking about is the externalization of European border torture in Libya, as would be said in the, by the following speaker. So the other policy brief also is about information campaign, which is very interesting in this subject matter because Australia is also another famous uh, famous country doing a lot of spending millions on information campaign. But putting a ga the Gambia, where I am from, uh, in, in, in this context, could set up which type of language or what is missing in this information campaign. Uh, there is an issue of relevance, there is issue of timing, and there is issue of specificity to the local needs and ideas. And there is also need for the feedback and evaluation mechanism. So the European Union or Australian authorities should know how you know, to get this feedback through different uh, phases, but also the duration of the campaign or to take into consideration the role of the local communities in the Gambia, one would have to cont continue to consider the Ubuntu culture, which is the solidarity, the communal wisdom that people uh, take together to send someone to, to migrate, for example. And also information campaign would have to decolonize the European curriculum or the colonial curriculum that the Gambia or other ex-colonial countries are, are, are experiencing. So therefore, this is my presentation, and I am presenting on behalf of my teammates, 
who are the ones that you can see there. I, I am hopeful that the conversation would allow me to do it well and give my own experience as a, as a migrant who has passed the Mediterranean Sea and has faced a lot of obstacles to, to be where I am today. And I am really uh, very excited to share with you this experience if, if time permits us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Alaji. This is a fantastic presentation and also it um, gives us the scope to ask you specific questions, um, including about your own experience. So thank you very much um, for that offer um, as well. Um, it is now my great pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Sara Kreta, and like um, Alaji, who has set the, um, the bar very high by being exactly 10 minutes, um, I'm sorry I have to restrict you all to 10 minutes when you're just so terrific, all of you, but um, I, I would now like to ask Sarah if you would now like to take the floor. So over to you, you're very welcome. Thank you, Philomena, and thank you, Alaji. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, it was a great pleasure to listen to your presentation and uh, to have you part of this uh, panel. Uh, it's uh, so needed and uh, exactly what you said about decolonizing uh, the image, the speech, the, the space, uh, the university, the knowledge. And so I really hope that my contribution will also go in this direction. Um, my work in the past year has been also um, very challenging um, because I try to combine yeah, on the ground reporting uh, and trying also to address uh, this issue of, you know, in the field of journalism, in the field of human rights, I try to engage with this concept of uh, representation, of uh, voice, of marginality. Um, as, as was said in the introduction, I extensively work um, on, on Libya and on the issue of uh, detention in Libya. And uh, yeah, it's true, my camera has been my, my, one of my, my most powerful tool when I was uh, filming inside the detention center, when I was filming with the Libyan Coast Guard, where I was hunting these spaces that are spaces where journalists are normally not allowed, where cameras cannot film, cannot enter. Because again, uh, when we talk about these policies of externalization are ultimately policies that are creating uh, black holes where um, journalists in the society, activists and migrants themselves are silenced. Um, so the first challenge that we face as journalists um, is literally to enter in these spaces uh, of control where a political or politics of control is embedded um, because the, the, the ultimate goal of these policies uh, is, is, exactly, um, they, is exactly this, that no journalist should be allowed to, to speak to, uh, or to be allowed to see um, how these policies in practice are, are being uh, designed. And, um, and there is exactly this hegemonic apparatus of power uh, that not only control bodies uh, of refugees in detention or in uh, spaces where journalists are not allowed, um, boats uh, or um, other vessels where migrants are detained, uh, containers, like I could list uh, different, you know, uh, areas where with colleagues we try to shed light on these practices of power and control and where migrants are repeatedly um, detained or, or silenced. And it's exactly there, I think, that we should, um, you know, despite uh, our, you know, courage or our will to, to tell a different story, we should try to investigate and reflect behind this, uh, you know, the frame that we create or behind the camera, the, 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 the ethical dimension that we, we can bring, right? Um, and here, I think it's important to mention um, the, the kind of work that, uh, that we do, um, it's not just engaging with, um, with the image production and with uh, you know, a kind of ecstatic, but is also um, working hand in hand with the, with the political representation. And, um, and these two categories, I believe, are, are working together, are, um, you know, are, are kind of part of the same, uh, 
the same dimension of, of work. Um, and when I talk about political aesthetic, I talk about also this idea of the, the visual that investigate this the economy of power in the sense that um, when I when I bring my camera in a detention center in Libya, or when I bring my camera on on a search and rescue uh, vessel or uh, with the Libyan Coast Guard, my presence on board the, 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 the vessel or my presence inside the tension center in Libya is challenging the, the power dimension that is created uh, in that context. When I access these spaces, uh, everything changed because they know that my presence there uh, will record and uh, will, will bring this image further. Um, so it's exactly that I think that we should investigate and how that um, power dimension is, is represented. Um, and, and, uh, and we should move the discussion from the, you know, from, and the focus from the product, uh, I don't, my documentary, my exposition, my film, to, to the practice and, and how we are engaging with these communities um, and how we, communities that you know, are either affected by conflict or that they are you know, silenced by this policy. And then we should literally rethink about the way that we as journalists um, are reproducing uh, this image are, are, um, and creating this knowledge. Um, that's why I think um, what is interesting here is, um, is the issue of media ethics and uh, the question of proximity and distance at the same time. Like today with the social media and with the fact that people have access to um, phones and um, way, for example, to record their own life, we create a different representation of, of that journey of, of, or, or that detention places. Uh, for example, I, um, I did an investigation on, on the issue of war crime that were committed uh, inside the detention center in Libya. And uh, some of the most powerful testimonies uh, of the atrocity that were committed inside these places were collected by refugees themselves that had the courage to document um, the violation, the, the fact that they were obliged to fight with the militia on the front line, also the, the fact that weapons were, were hidden inside these detention places. And through this um, recording, we were able to you know, re re reconstruct um, how the place was used to, keep, to keep weapon, how the place was used to uh, assort refugees and, and so on, right? So this image of um, sufferance created by, by the refugees themselves, they had that political dimension that uh, could bring the discussion one step forward, right? And, and then interrogate the EU in terms of how it's possible to, to send people back to Libya and to keep people uh, inside places that are used as a military base during a conflict. This um, can, can, uh, can be called a, a war crime. So in, I think in, in the way that um, we try to you know, surface this emotional rupture with um, one side, yeah, we do have uh, you know, biographic narratives of, of people that are crossing uh, the central Mediterranean, but at the same time, we try to establish a truth where image um, that are coming to newsroom or image that are coming to my phone uh, because they are sent to me, um, via mobile or WhatsApp, they become these new affordances where um, that they, they allow me to, to alter this dimension of power, to alter this construction of authority, to alter this idea of uh, authenticity. Uh, and ultimately, they allow me to cross this uh, moral responsibility, I think, in different ways, in different form of uh, witnessing uh, and, and, and acting as a testimony of, of this violence. So I think um, it's, a, it's, it's in this place that the ethical dilemma is it's, uh, re-emerging and positioning in the sense that um, uh, it's not just a reproduction of uh, image of in violence or image of like detention, but is also interrogate this ethical position uh, that is emerging from from the bottom, right? On on the fact that yeah, we are uh, we are here, we exist, and uh, we want to represent our sufferance by by ourselves. Uh, by uh, creating a rupture with the way that uh, the sufferance was represented till now. Um, for example, in my, my last work, 
I included um, a lot of uh, um, content that was created by refugees in detention um, by the way that they were themselves recording protests, the way that they were you know, showing their bodies and voices in a political uh, way, in a political dimension, uh, where ultimately they were asking accountability for from the EU um, and how this um, policy of uh, externalization, and we call it externalization, but actually is a racial policy of distinction who has the right to access to the EU and who has not the right to access to the EU. And, um, and it was exactly the way that I narrated the, um, this policy through the image of refugees that organize um, uh, protests inside detention centers or that they organize a uh, march to demand uh, the right to exist, the right to be seen, the right to speak uh, on their behalf. Um, that created that rupture that I was trying to, to describe where we can separate um, this positionality, but at, at the same time, um, bridge the idea of ethics and uh, and politics and and i think this was also um extremely powerful um when i screened the movie for example at the eu level or uh, with the um, eu representative uh, or uh, representative of the united nation um the idea that refugees were bringing a political question there uh, was unexpected um and that was um was mm, for me, um, it was not surprising, but it was interesting to see that, uh, again, uh, when we talk about refugee voices, we don't expect uh, refugees to have a political voice, to have a political claim, or to have an idea about the EU. Um, and, and I think that's exactly the direction where we should, uh, we should work in the future, uh, especially on, on the issue of accountability and on the issue of like border control. Um, it's the focus should be on on uh, not uh, not on the biography of refugees crossing the border, but on the way that this power and this uh, dynamic of control is built through um, agreement, through um, uh, contracts uh, with um, with the uh, companies that are ultimately European company that are recreating uh, you know a, a colonial uh, dimension on. In, in Africa by the way that they are contracted to build uh, borders over there or um, yeah so try to investigate this uh, these areas that uh, as I said they are gray areas where it's uh, difficult to access and um, and the work of academics and journalists should be you know together with the work of refugees and community affected by conflict thank you Thank you so much, Sarah, and I look forward to hearing more about this um, during the discussion later. Um, thank you for bearing witness to us and for talking about how refugees themselves are using um, their bodies and their expressions um, for this, um, uh, for their to express their political voice. Um, thank you so much. Um, it is now my pleasure to ask Moz uh, Mustafa um, as a Mitavar, if you would, could please now talk for um, 10 minutes about your, um, about your experience. Thank you. Thanks, Vila Lema, for having me. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of, I stand today, the Gadigal land of Eora nation. We recognize that sovereignty was never ceded and that we are on stolen land. Uh, I would like to pay my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, others past, present, and emerging. My name is Moss. I am a refugee who was locked up in detention for eight years by the Australian government for no crime. And uh, the government treated me um, very uh, bad. Also, um, more than 3,000 people were in this situation that I was through. Manus, Nauru, Christmas Island, and everyone called those places as processing center. That place, to me, Manus Detention Center is a prison, not processing center. They killed my friend, 
they tortured us, they stoned at us, they killed numbers of us, they tortured us, they stopped water, power, electricity, they removed all the securities from us, they left us alone in a very horrible situation and Ben Doherty is this in this meeting and he came to that situation. He saw how the terrible situation was terrible and how the government left us alone without water. Who can believe that this government, this the Australian government stopped uh, giving us food and water for 24 days? This government is cruel and also um, the opposition party uh, is stamping this cruelty with their silence. I was transferred to Australia for medical help, but they locked me up in a room on the third floor of a hotel for 15 months. The officers over there hurt me a lot. They did the path search of my body over 400 times. And people in Australia are paying tax for these people who are torturing me and um, other thousands of refugees who are locked up in those torture centers. These places are not processing center. These places are torture centers and people pay tax for keeping these places. What we want is to shut down these places. What has uh, remained for this land is that 14, uh, over $12 billion have uh, been spent for torturing innocent people like me. They took eight years of my life. They separated um, us from the society. And the situation hasn't been better since I got free. They tell me I am not allowed to get a qualification. I am not allowed to study. I am not allowed to have Centerlink. They don't give me accommodation. The opposition party is silent. Who do we have in this country? Who is, I don't want anyone to tell my story without my permission. I, my voice is very strong to break all the tinted glasses that was locked up. I want people in Australia be behind refugees voices, behind my voice. And I can tell the truth because in media, the government um, buy all the media and they control the narrative and people listen to TV. Refugees are illiterate, dangerous. They are not welcome here. Obviously, this government hates refugees. And also, uh, we don't have uh, support uh, like other people in the society. So we have to uh, be creative. So I, when I was, imagine I was in that situation and they, uh, every day they tell me that you cannot be free. You, should live in Manus. You cannot uh, study. Have you thought about going back to your country? I came to Australia for safety. I was in danger. I was a human rights activist. And this, and eight years in detention was the price of uh, my human rights. Australia took eight years of my life. So, when people hear about my story, most of people that I have talked with, 
and they actually all of people that I tell their story, uh, they I see I see a lot of change. I see that they don't know the they didn't hear about the reality because what they uh, hear from TV from media is totally different from the way I tell their story to them. I have seen that and many people told me that we don't want to vote the government anymore. That's why I want to say that we need to empower people who have the capacity of power, not to uh, put someone in a position who is uh, like a scarecrow. And we say that this person is better than the government. As long as we uh, uh, give power to the politicians who create silence and stamp the cruelty of the government with their silence, we will never change this society. To me, the result of this election is not important. What important is to change the society, to help people who are on the edge of the society, vulnerable people, Aboriginal people, people who need help. But these people are alone because the, uh, we don't have um, enough good politicians to take care of vulnerable people. When we get together, we can sort out this problem. This problem hasn't been sorted out uh, over, two, uh, over 20 years and it's going on. We need to put all the egos and logos aside and remove all the problems. And it starts with giving uh, this, the right to these innocent people, right? uh, like studying, like get a qualification, to have center link, medical treatment. Imagine Nelson Mandela during apartheid was allowed to study most in Australia, in a developed country in 2022 is not allowed to study. It is, I don't uh, want to blame people, but I blame people who uh, have power and they are silent. I don't want anyone to use my image as a victim. I am a fighter and I am allowed and I am able to fight for myself and other refugees. That's why we need to uh, get to be in a circle that can uh, create change. I am a creator and I decide uh, my work is, uh, is to create stories uh, in a positive way to I am a, an artist. I paint with a toothbrush, which is um, which is uh, a friend of mine. I paint with this because this is the connection of art world with human rights and myself as well to show that I am innocent. I am not illegal. I am a survivor. I forgive, but I don't forget. And I hope one day soon, we create a circle of hope and uh, remove these problems and help people who are really suffering in this society. Because I believe this country is beautiful. This country is so precious apart from this government. So let's together and get together and sort out this problem and I am sure we will do that together. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very powerful uh, witnessing of your own experience. Um, Moz, thank you for, um, for reminding us of how much still needs to be done and 
we're very grateful for your creative talents. That toothbrush is not just a toothbrush for you, but it is such a, a valuable tool uh, for narrative um, for your story. So thank you um, for sharing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our fourth speaker, uh, Ben Doherty. Um, so over to you, Ben, to speak for about 10 minutes. We will have good time for a discussion, so I'm sorry for keeping you all to time. Um, thank you so much, um, uh, Moz, and over to Ben. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and thank you to my, uh, my other panellists. It's been fascinating to, uh, to listen to um, all of your addresses. I hope I can um, keep up the standard. I, I just thought I would, I would reflect on um, uh, the, uh, the title of, of, our, of our session tonight, Perceptions and Narratives of Refugees, and just some reflections, I suppose, from my own experience, which has largely been in the Australian context, but also how I've seen that parlayed into to what's happening in Europe and elsewhere around the world. Um, we have seen, I would argue, in Australia, particularly over the last two decades, and we can get into the, the, the weeds of the history about the Tampa affair and, and, and various other sort of acute moments in, in Australian political history, but we have seen this powerful and deliberate rhetorical shift in the way that this country talks about asylum and people seeking sanctuary uh, about refugees and the issue of forced migration generally. Um, we've gone from a country that talks about um, asylum seekers arriving to having illegals. We don't have an immigration department. We have a, a border force. We, we have the issue of migration is now framed and particularly people seeking asylum is now framed as this matter of of border pr protection that, that Australia needs to be protected from threats to national security. And that discourse, which has been promoted, particularly by the conservative side of politics in Australia, has become the, the sort of standard language that is used um, when ministers talk about it, it's reproduced in newspapers, on news bulletins, it, it becomes the dominant narrative. And it has been hugely damaging in this country, I'd argue, in changing people's understanding of what we're talking about, that we are talking about people um, in some of the most difficult situations in the world at, at times, seeking sanctuary in Australia. And um, that, that, legal, that, that, right, that legal act, that right that people are exercising to seek protection, um, to, to seek asylum has been um, sort of twisted by this language, has been contorted into something completely different. It's some sort of threat that as though Australia is being invaded, that, that, that there is, uh, there is some sort of external threat that needs to be um, uh, to be defended against. Um, we hear this very militarised, this very securitised language. And beyond the rhetoric, which in and of itself is very powerful in changing people's understandings, I would argue as well that that rhetoric has served a further function as, um, I suppose, it is also the basis in lots of ways for the actual policies themselves, these punitive policies, these um, these policies that are built around uh, deterrence and punishment and detention and, and Moles has spoken so eloquently about his own incredibly difficult experience of, of, of living through those policies. But those policies are made possible, I would argue, in a significant way by the rhetoric that's preceded them, by talking about refugees, as, as Moles said, by talking about refugees and asylum seekers as illegals, as queue jumpers, as some sort of threat to Australia, that creates a foundation, that creates a political environment where, pun where punitive policies like offshore detention, like indefinite detention, can be implemented. I mean, as a government, if an, if an asylum seeker reaches your, your borders um, uh, seeking sanctuary, as a government, your response, your obligation as a response is to provide, is to provide safety, is to provide protection. If an illegal, if some, if 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 somebody who you're calling an illegal present, uh, arrives on your shores, then that enables you. In fact, it, it almost compels you to respond in a punitive, um, uh, deterrent sense to 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 respond with a with a policy um, like offshore detention, like indefinite detention. So my argument is that the rhetoric in and of itself is dangerous and is misleading and is untrue. But it's what that rhetoric then does as well. What that rhetoric then enables that is also intensely problematic because it creates the foundation, it creates the political climate, it creates the rationale that governments can reach for in order to implement these policies. So, um, you know, words make worlds in a way. Um, the words and, and the, the language we use around issues um, are incredibly powerful in creating people's understandings, but then also in creating how a society responds to those issues. So I, I think that's, that's a... Um, 
uh, um, uh, my my first point. Um, my second point would be about, and, and this was mentioned by, by you, Philomena, um, these policies, um, when they're promoted by governments, are, are, are seen as, I, I think in your words, attractive electorally, which was a very nice um, diplomatic way to put it. Um, and we've seen that from Australia. We've we've seen a, you know a, a consecutive um, a rather successive Australian government sort of promoting um, themselves as being tough on borders as 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 cracking down on on people seeking asylum in this country um, as though that's something to be to be lauded and and we've then seen that those policies and those those ideas that framework I suppose that paradigm of, of looking at this issue promoted overseas and and so we see now from the Home Secretary in the UK pretty Patel using the exact same language that Australia has been hearing for 20 years about taking back control of borders and, you know, smashing the people smugglers model, all of this sort of rhetoric, all of these devices, all of these tropes we've been hearing for years in Australia are now becoming embedded in the language and the discourse that's happening um, in, in the UK and in Europe and elsewhere. Um, and Australia has openly, you know, promoted its policies around the world saying, we've got a solution for you. Here's a solution um, as though, there, you know, these these policies are are any solution at all, um, and and the UK has been quite overt in saying we're copying the Australian model. We we've looked to what Australia's done, and we're we're seeking to do that as well. So um, again, there's a there's a sort of sequence going on here that you've got this rhetoric, you've got this atmosphere created, you've got this political culture created, you've got these policies that are implemented. They're then promoted overseas. Again, that rhetoric emerges, um, and these perceptions of na and and narratives around refugees. Are then more are more and more firmly embedded, and they're being, and those narratives are being weaponized against refugees and people seeking asylum again elsewhere around the world. Um, I'm a journalist by trade. I, I I use words for a living, so I'm I'm interested in in words and the way they're used and the way they they they're manipulated and the way their meanings change. Um, and I think uh, you know the, the, it's an incredibly important part of 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 my job is is is. Um, is a consideration of the way I use words and, and, and the way words are, are used around me. Um, and I, I wrote a paper several years ago that I can share with people if they're inter interested about this issue, about the, the, the sort of, I call it the semantic struggle over seeking asylum in Australia. Um, and I had some sort of notes towards the end of it. I was, I, just before I, I came here, I was sort of reading over again about, about how journalists should approach this issue. And I'm, I'm you know, a believer in a free press, um, I'm wary of being prescriptive in saying to journalists uh, or, or, or anybody in, you know, who, who's, who's debating these issues in public, you know, you must use this language, you must use these words, this means this. That, I think, that, that sort of dogmatism is, is dangerous. But I would urge that I think for anybody working in this area as an academic, as a journalist, people who are in the public square debating this issue, a consciousness about language, um, an awareness of the words that you're using um, and the impact they're having and how they're being perceived by others. What, what's the baggage behind this word? What, what are the implications? Um, what are the connotations of the language I'm using? And, and, and what, is, what, it, what, what is that doing you know, to, the, to the narrative I'm feeding into, to the, to the, to the perception I'm, I'm solidifying by that language? I, I, I think an awareness of language is, is hugely critical. I think, um, I am deeply worried often that in Australian journalism, um, government language is reproduced unquestioningly, unthinkingly. A minister calls somebody an illegal. It's not illegal to seek asylum. I'm just putting it out there. But we have ministers in, in, in successive Australian governments who refer to people as illegals. Um, and then that language is, is repeated in the media. It, it, the soundbite makes onto the TV. The words are reproduced in the newspaper the next day. It gets embedded. It gets... Um, not sanctified, but it gets solidified, I, 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 I suppose, through that reproduction. Um, and I think journalists, of course, have, an, have a responsibility to, you know, to accuracy, uh, to impartiality, to, to reporting fairly and, and comprehensively. But I think journalists also have a responsibility to question um, and to question the narratives that lie underneath the language that's being used, um, to correct in their copy if they have to, ministers who use language incorrectly. I remember getting an angry phone call from, I won't mention which prime minister, but, but a prime minister's office because a prime minister referred to, to uh, a, a refugee as an economic migrant and not a real refugee. And I wrote that the prime minister was wrong in, in what he said. And, 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 um, and I, uh, I, think, I think that it's not a skepticism, it's not a cynicism, but, it, but, it's, but it's a willingness to question 
and not to accept these words and this language and these perceptions on face value. I think that's very, very important. Journalists have a, a question to challenge, I suppose, those those orthodoxies those, and, and that group think on behalf of, of the people they serve, which is their readers and listeners. Um, I might, I'm conscious of time, so I might conclude there. Thank you so much, Ben. You have certainly covered a, a lot in your 10 minutes also. Um, this idea of challenging um, destructive, corrosive narratives and rhetorics and the way that they've become embedded, for example, here in Australia and indeed in Europe is a huge, um, hugely important point. And thank you for um, telling us about it in um, such a vibrant way. Um, it is now um, the time for us to uh, hear uh, Pierluigi Muzaro's uh, reflections um, on the presentations so far. Um, we will then have a question and answer session, uh, which Pierluigi will be uh, moderating with, with me, and um, uh, we will be taking questions from you. Um, so please feel free to use the chat function, all of you who are participating, and indeed um, to say who you are directing the question to, if it's to one particular person. But first of all, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, once again our a wonderful Conrep colleague, uh, Pierre Luigi, over to you for about up to 13 minutes. Thanks very much, uh, Prof. Murray, and thanks very much to all the speakers. I was really impressed by your talk. I mean, I know very well uh, Alaji and Sarah, but really to listen also Mustafa and Ben comments, I think it's very, very useful uh, way to share our experience, our knowledge, and to try to have an impact, which I think is the aim also of, uh, I mean, of, of our uh, uh, work, of our mission. Let me say that, uh, I mean, Alaji was talking about this uh, project, an horizon that we share, perception, which is quite interesting because I remember when I was invited uh, to contribute to the design of this proposal by other universities, uh, there was written in the proposal that we should understand the perception that would-be migrants have uh, about Europe in order to correct them. And so it was like, wow, how can we correct the perception of other people about Europe? And what is the correct perception of Europe that we think we can teach to other people, right? I mean, this is related to what uh, Alaji was saying about the information campaigns. Also with CONREP, we work a lot on awareness campaign. We are producing a book now, which is one of the output of this amazing project that you, Philomena, are uh, managing. And I mean, if you think about the awareness campaign and they think about uh, No Way by Australia or uh, awareness, uh, uh, aware migrants or other campaigns that we have in Europe, of course, here we have a sort of uh, northern hegemonic perspective where the idea of this uh, warning uh, even talking in, ten in, in terms of uh, human rights but at the end what we see is a sort of process of bordering where you are using a sort of symbolic space in order to legitimate the externalization of the border. So in this case, this kind of campaign, as Alaji was saying, are reproducing, reinforcing a sort of sovereignist symbolic space where there is the us and them. And so for this reason, I think that it is very important to talk and to, uh, to, to, to denounce in terms also of policy brief uh, about these complex issues through a simple language. Yesterday, we opened again this red carpet, which is an installation, a creative installation, an artistic performance that we realized here with an Iranian artist and with a company of uh, refugees who work with theater, because the idea is to do not only an impact on policymakers directly, but to use creativity in order to do audience engagement and audience development. I mean, the idea is not only to do the research, interview, focus group, social media analysis, whatever, but then to promote inclusion of people, to create awareness 
not just about uh, the perception of Europe and the risk or the threats about crossing irregularly the border, but about uh, the conditions beyond the borders, the conditions of people who are forced to cross irregularly the border. And so for this reason, I think that also the awareness through the creative materials is very important because it is, is a way to develop, to engage different people and to have an impact on vulnerable lives. For this reason, I think that um, the role of media is fundamental. When we talk about uh, uh, migration or asylum seekers, and here Ben was just saying, you know, economic migrants to refugees. Yes, but here we are talking about juridical categories, but where media, the imaginary, is very important in order to influence uh, the, 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 the idea of these juridical categories. I mean, I remember in 2015, uh, during the so-called crisis, the Balkan route, the Mediterranean one, where BBC decided to use only economic migrants or just migrants. These people are migrants, right? Because the BBC was saying, until the point they don't get the recognition of refugees, they are migrants. But we know that there is a sort of stigma against economic migrants, right? We know that if you go to undertake an interview when you ask asylum, if you uh, if the committee think that you are an economic migrant, they think that you are cheating them. And so it means, please go home and try again. So for this reason, I think that after five days, Al Jazeera answered to BBC saying no, because 85% of these people come from Afghanistan, Eritrea, whatever, so we will call them refugees, which means to have a different impact on the imaginary. Talking about the imaginary, I really appreciate, and we present in Bologna, her documentary, the documentary of Sara Creta, where uh, the, the camera is not only a, a very important instrument to document violation and to ask for accountability, but also to give voice to people and to create architecture of listening. I mean, in these days, I think it's like three or four days ago, Fabrice Leggeri, the director of Frontex, was forced to leave Frontex, as well as four days, the, the, the tribunal of Laia, the criminal court in Europe, recognized that in Libya there are crimes against humanity. I mean, here is uh, important the, 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 the work like uh, Sarah uh, does about who has the right to move, because this is the problem. I mean, uh, yesterday I read the notice, the news that uh, in Italy arrived in the last two months, 100,000 Ukrainians. And while I was reading this news, I was thinking, wow, this is a great news, but not because 100,000 Ukrainians arrived, because they are just uh, running away from the war, they are suffering, they are vulnerable people, there is pain. They are just a drop in eight millions of Ukrainians who are in risk to go out of their country. But the good news it, that is that in Italy and in other countries, we were able to host 100,000 Ukrainians without using the terms emergency, without talking about crisis, without talking about the invasions of refugees. We are talking about solidarity. We are talking about hospitality. So this is the good news. And it demonstrates that of course there are different borders, that of course there are different treatments. If you are Ukrainians, almost European, or if you are Africans arriving by boat, right? I mean, in this case it's important because borders are not natural, are built by us, right? Are built first of all in a symbolic way 
and then in a physical one. And the externalization just showed this, but also showed that migration is a natural phenomenon, but the definition is political. So we can see that this definition then has an impact. And what kind of an impact? Here I think about, uh, I mean, the link between Sarah and Mustafa. Thanks, Mustafa, uh, for sharing your story. I think it's very important. And also the way you do this story. I know well Berus Bocciani because we had a few meetings. We present his book in Italy and whatever. And I really, uh, I mean, I'm, I appreciate this, uh, uh, this capacity to denounce the terrible cruelty of detention and to use again some names, detention centers. Because also when we talk about Libya, I listen to people, even professionals, even experts, saying reception centers. These are not reception centers. These are detention centers, right? There is a convention of Geneva and whatever. And then when you talk about Manus, and in Europe we think, oh, but this is Australia right now, you know, this is far away. Come on, Johnson in UK, what is trying to do? He's trying to externalize the border in Rwanda. He's trying to create a Manus Island in Rwanda. And Denmark is trying to do something with the Balkans. So I think that what you really denounce, Mustafa, is very, very important because uh, you say I'm not a victim. You are a victim. You are a victim of this uh, unjust system as uh, there are many victims about that but you are not just a victim. And this is very important because being a victim, it doesn't mean to be object of our pity, to being object of our fear, but it means to, recon to recognize that you have an agency, that you are a subject and not only an object, that you have the capacity of power to resist, to speak, to fight, because, uh, I think that here, and I close, uh, if we think about that naming is dominating, giving voice and use this kind of words is very important in order to deborder the imaginaries, to deborder the way we talk about that, and also to invite people, to force people to take their own, our own responsibility. And in this case, I think that what Mustafa also showed is the ability to respond, to give an answer to an unjust treatment. I think I will stop here so that Philo, if you agree, we can open to questions because I'm also very curious to listen to other people and also our guests to talk again about their experience. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Pier Luigi, for your comments, which are challenging um, preconceptions and misconceptions, among other things. Um, just a reminder that I uh, referred to the chat function. It is, of course, the Q&A function um, that you should be using in order to um, put your questions up. Um, so we do invite you um, to put your questions um, to us. While we are waiting for those to come through, um, I would like to ask Pier Luigi if you have any particular questions for um, individual um, uh, speakers or indeed if you would like to ask about the what do we the counter narratives I know that it's not such a binary but you know this is um, something that Alaji spoke about at the very beginning how we can challenge those um, narratives that corrosive yes narratives. I would like uh... I mean, I think that uh, it's one of the common point of uh, all the, the different talks of our four guests is this kind of relationship that could be very challenging be between what we can call the ethics of showing to the nuns through journalism, through the testimony, through art, uh, and the ethics of seeing which is something that is more related to the audience, to the spectator. So what is the ethics, as also Sarah was mentioning, about showing 
for example, the violations and what is the ethics of seeing certain kind of images and to have certain reaction. So I would like if uh, you can talk a little bit more just about this kind of relationship. How do you deal with this uh, uh, kind of link between the ethics of showing and the ethics of seeing? And here, I think that every one of you can comment because I mean, from different perspectives, everyone has something uh, specific to say. Shall I ask, first of all, to Sarah to comment two minutes and then maybe Ben, Alaji, and Mustafa? Yeah, I can, I can jump in and, um, and mention, uh, I think, uh, something that is uh, really related to, to, to Italy and to Europe, that is the Central Mediterranean. I think in the Central Mediterranean, there has been a huge shift in the way that we, we see, we record, we witness. And, um, and, and ultimately in the way that the imaginary was created around, uh, around what was happening. Um, myself, I was on board of a search and rescue vessel in 2016. And those years were the years where there were thousands of people rescued on the same day. Um, I was filming those, uh, those rescue operation. And I remember um, I was constantly questioning my positionality right because i was embedded with a um, humanitarian organization and they want me to reproduce a humanitarian um, discourse a humanitarian uh, narrative of help of care of uh, bringing these people to safety um, after a few months things have turned the other way around because italy signed a memorandum of understanding with libya and then uh, rescue operation were not allowed anymore in the same way and also those uh, NGOs and those um, mm, image of care that NGOs were reproducing were kind of banned uh, from the public imaginary. And um, journalists that started to you know, talk about this were also under surveillance by um, persecutors and judges in Italy. And, um, and again, rescues, uh, rescue workers were under criminalization and the, the effort of the rescue workers were, were brought to yeah to courts and um, and then people started to be afraid of speaking out right rescue workers didn't allow journalists anymore to follow their their operation um search and rescue vessel were banned from showing the the image of refugees and, and migrants and ultimately uh the only image that we could with we could witness were the image of refugees brought back to libya and not anymore the image of refugees stepping, stepping in Italy. And um, little by little, um, the same, um, um, that's why I talk about distance and access when I talk about the way we produce image and the imagery, I think it's relevant in the sense that um, uh, when we are close to these places, detention places, hotels where migrants are kept, um, places like uh, the quarantine vessel where migrants are obliged to stay in Italy. Uh, we are close and we can film and we can record and we can build a kind of imaginary together with this, with, with the people that we record. Uh, we can create art, we can create, uh, you know, the, the impactful uh, uh, production that we were talking. But when we cannot access these places, because we are not allowed to, to film there. Because even uh, today, for a journalist, if the, the, a boat is arriving to Italy and I want to record the, the, or speak with the people that are stepping uh, on the Italian soil, I'm not allowed to do so. I cannot record his testimony. While if there was a boat full of Europeans crossing the Mediterranean and those survivors will be brought to safety, immediately we will have thousands of TV channels uh, on that land recording and asking how was your trip, how it went, why did you come here, what, how, how you know, like uh, the, the witnessing. Uh, and that's why, again, um, when we talk about imaging and imagery production, when we talk about, you know, um, the ethic of seeing, we need to talk about distance and uh, we need to talk about, you know, 
how, how much can we have access to these places to, to create this public discourse to document. That's why our, for example, in our last investigation where we, uh, we, we raise again the, the role of Frontex and the, the role of the EU, again, we need to work with the data that are um, denied by, by the EU, denied by the Italian authority, denied by everyone. These data are not on the public knowledge. To get this data, we need whistleblower, we need freedom of information, access to, you know, like uh, internal reports, documents that are not on a pub, that should be on the public knowledge, that should be allowed, we should be allowed to, to scrutinize this, but by the fact that we are not allowed to access this document, it's extremely difficult to build a different narrative, um, and, uh, and that's what they create, you know? That's right. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, because you're, you're talking not just about the criminalization, for example, of rescue workers, but you're also talking about what so we all know about, and that is the criminalization and the securitization in many cases of refugees. And Mars has talked to us about how security guards have consistently been invasive in on his body, for instance. That's part of that securitization. It's not just at borders, it's actually um, on the, um, the individual body of the refugee as well. So we have Home Affairs, we've got Frontex, and we've got others who have this criminalization and this securitization um, taking place. Um, we have got a question, if it's okay, Pierre-Louis, would you like me to read it out? Okay, it's from Tamara Tabakovic, who is at the University of Warwick, and of course she is a member of our Conrad um, team. Um, she said, thank you very much, and she has thanked all of you for your discussion about contesting narratives. She wanted to know whether you think change in policy, this is a question for members of the panel, do you think change in policy is possible by advocating alternative visions by refugees, academics and civil society, for example, is the aim to try to shift public attitudes so that citizens hold governments accountable? Or can we try to shift government's beliefs about refugees? Um, I'm happy to, to speak to this and also to- I have to start to, on you, Ben, so okay. thank you. And, 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 and to Pierre Luigi's um, uh, point before, um, uh, one of the things uh, I think it's really interesting here in Australia at the moment where we're in the middle of what feels to be an interminable election campaign. We're having a, a federal election at the moment. And there does feel to me to be a shift in discourse in Australia around the issue of asylum seekers, around Australia's asylum policies, um, uh, and and uh, essentially that, that militarised, securitised uh, uh, response, particularly around offshore processing um, and, and offshore detention is being questioned. Obviously, Manus Island was found to be illegal and shut down, but Australia does have what it calls an enduring offshore processing um, uh, facility in, on the island of Nauru. But I, I, I think, and this goes to, to both questions a little bit, uh, sort of uh, to Pierre Luigi's question, you asked about the ethics of, of, of uh, showing and the ethics of seeing. And I'm interested, I, I think, in a lot of ways in the question behind that as well about who's telling this story, who's in charge of this story, who's controlling this narrative. And I think one of the things that's been incredibly powerful in, in the Australian public debate in recent years has been refugees and asylum seekers themselves taking control of narratives and telling their own stories. And it's people like, as you mentioned, Pierre Luigi Ferrus Bushani, it's people like Moz, who've, who've been powerful advocates, um, uh, articulate spokespeople, not only for their own situations, but for the broader issue. Um, we've seen recently, um, uh, there was a young guy, Mehdi Ali, who was a, a young uh, Iranian who'd been detained for nine years since, since arriving in Australia as, as a 15 year old. He happened to be in the Park Hotel in Melbourne when Novak Djokovic arrived in Australia and then was sent, and Novak Djokovic was sent to his hotel. He rang me and said, you won't, you won't believe who's turned up in our hotel. It's Novak Djokovic. And all of a sudden, for all the wrong reasons, the world's media's attention was on this this hotel and Mehdi Ali sort of was was aware of of of, of the um the opportunity this presented and really grabbed it with both hands and he became the spokesman for all of these refugees and asylum seekers who were being held in this part in, in park hotel most of whom had been in detention not necessarily in that hotel but detained by australia somewhere for up to nine years and said you don't understand what's happening in this place no one was paying attention to this place before but now you are and now i've got your attention i'm going to tell you what's happening um, so in an inadvertent way, 
the Novak Djokovic debacle, he, I, I'm, and I'm going to assume people are, are familiar with him trying to get to Australia to play in the, in the Australian Open tennis tournament, um, shone a light on, on Australia's sort of hidden refugee um, uh, issues that, that really weren't being discussed. But it wasn't a journalist exposing it. It, 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 it. it really was a refugee at the centre of that, sitting in a hotel room, being able to say, you need to listen to my story. And he was articulate. He was, he was passionate in a way that, that people like Moz, who's, who's, who's told his story through his words, but also through his music. You know, he's collaborated with, Moz has collaborated with some of the biggest bands in Australia, a band called Midnight Oil, you know, through his art, through Beruz, through his filmmaking, through his books. Um, I think, I think refugees telling stories themselves and having control of that narrative has been hugely powerful in changing Australia's perceptions because the voices I were hearing before were, you know, the sort of, um, you know, the, the government fists on the table about border protection and control, taking back control and all these sorts of things. And actually, once we, get, we begin to hear the, the human stories and actually the reality of what's happening in these places, that has changed Australian perception. So um, this federal election, we have seen a number of independent candidates running in seats that are, that are traditionally held by conservatives um, and, pa and part of their, their campaign is we need a more humane policy towards refugees. We need changes in the way we approach this issue. We're, the way, the prism through which we look at this issue is all wrong and we need to change that. And, and that's not a debate that we've seen in previous Australian elections. And I'm, I know there's lots of Australians on the line here, but for, for people not familiar with Australian politics, so many Australian uh, elections are fought on on this sort of who can be toughest on borders, who can be strongest, who can be most sort of you know despotic almost about it. Um, sorry, I talked a bit long there, but that was the way. Thank you very much for ra raising all of these issues, particularly the issue um, the, the issues about. Um, how we need to change that prism. And we have actually got a few questions here um, about this whole issue of um, the visibility of those who are seeking refuge and how to make difference to negative um, narratives. And linked to that is a question specifically for Moz on how you would imagine or would wish for yourself portrait to make a difference on how you are perceived, going back to this, one of the themes that we have today about using art as way of resisting these narratives that Louis, Pierre Luigi and Sarah have also talked about. So Moz, it was about how you imagine or would wish for yourself portrait to make a difference in how you are perceived. Uh, well, I will uh, talk about uh, my self-portrait um, in coming weeks, in coming days, properly. Um, but I tell you uh, something that how they wanted to reduce us because animals cannot paint. They removed our names that my name was KNS088, not Mustafa Azimitabar. Imagine for eight years, they labeled this number on, on, on me and also other refugees. And I had to continue this, um, this sadness with myself. This sadness was with me for eight years. So a good part of freedom is I have my, my name now. I have my, I brought my name back to myself and how they told me that we cannot give you paint because you may eat the paint yeah. and it kills you. Imagine how, when I say $12 billion were spent, Ben Doherty came to Manus, came to see when, when I didn't have water, we dug in the ground. We survived. I, when I say we survived, it, it was an absolutely a miracle I survived. So when I came to my room and they said, you, when you, because when you eat the pain, it kills you. And I, coffee was the only material that I could stick on the paper. And I didn't have any uh, experience of art and using toothbrush on a dragging toothbrush on a paper was a moment of success that they want to stop me in any, any ways, but I, they cannot take this toothbrush from me. They don't let me study 
but I have still my toothbrush and I will paint more and more because uh, art, music is another world, another world for me, but I love the connection. I love the way I can be connected with different circles like art, music, human rights, climate change. And I think uh, when we can um, connect these circles together, we will see uh, a lot of change in this society. Unfortunately, uh, I, I don't see a lot of connections like climate change, human rights. Many circles are disconnected with each other. This is really sad when I, when I talk about it. I hope um, to, in a simple language, with a sim my simple language, I hope this toothbrush, the story of this toothbrush goes to different circles and bring connections and um, bring uh, kindness back to this society because I really uh, believe that people in Australia are not racist. I hear a lot that Australians are racist, but I believe people in Australia are not racist because I, when I talk to them, I don't feel any, any bad, uh, I don't see any bad feeling. I feel they haven't heard enough about this story. So we have two weeks bef uh, to election and hopefully uh, uh, we will hear good stories uh, next week so that we can at least uh, change some votes together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moz. You've explained very clearly how your toothbrush has become a tool of resistance, a tool of art and tool of creativity um, and is in itself a form of agency and indeed um, of narrative. Um, I have a question here for LIG and it really relates partly to tomorrow's question around policy and how we can change it. And the question is, how do you hope that your work and the work of your colleagues on your Horizon 2020 Perceptions project, how do you hope that your work will impact on policy? How can you, do you think it can help to change policy? And you've spoken a little bit about the policy reports we know, which are terrific. Um, so just really, if you could add, give us a few comments um, about that, please. Yes, uh, I want to pick up from what uh, Brother Moses was saying. I think we can actually add more to what you've said so 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 explicitly. And uh, yeah, I I think so that in, in in this world that I live in, that we all live in, there are certain personalities that have enormous powers. You know, those are artists and then politicians, and then scientists used to have this thing, but that is confined to let's say atomic physicists who individually could make some changes. It was out of the desire of individual impulses of artists, you know, who, were, who, who brought up the culture that we have. We, we, we remember in antique Greek and Rome, the whole society was left to go for, for, for hunting while artists and scientists were left home to look because of the enormous power they have. Today, this power is kind of in, in the hands of politicians. So this is why policy brings are important to bring these messages to politicians, but also because I find an enormous difficulty in the project as stated by Professor uh, Muzaro to, to, to digest perceptions and narratives and the so much concentration on it, the billions that are spent on information campaign. I believe that there should be a shift as if to concentrate on the actual reality, the killings, the tortures, rather than talking about changing the subjective perceptions of people that will always continue. And in fact, it's important that this diversity of narratives and that they are here, that there is no hegemony, or we can try to produce some kind of balance between, but they should continue. I believe that Europe and the whole world should concentrate on the reality, like the reality that these are modern prisons. When Moses was talking about his imprisonment, I, 
I was crying because I remember my own time in the asylum camp in Italy here, where I was, I was hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital for two times and two weeks each time I was taken there. I was chained on the bed because I was considered part so crazy and even my legs were chained. But out of the spiritual power I had, at some point I, I freed myself. And it was the, it is this trauma that made me to cry. And it, it you, 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 what you were saying revital. And this is not me. We are human beings because when we see the suffering of other people, we can feel it. And this is the connection that I am like in in in, in the Gambia we call it Ubuntu. You are because I am. I am because we are. So this sense of being together, what Moses talk to, I think is something that we have to do a little bit more is from the spiritual part. There are other things that we can talk about, but there are other things that individually we should do. And this, I call it spiritual. And this has to do with what the question that was posed to uh, Sarah, the documentary, the ethics of seeing and the ethics of sowing. I think we have shown enough. We have shown a lot of stuff. What has the the, 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 the depredation of people? Because you can go historically to antique slavery, the barbarism of the indigenous people in Australia, or like the barbarism that is imposed upon us, the migrants, are all part of the reality that we should concentrate on rather than the perception that that vulnerable person is having in the ghetto. So when we look at this interconnection, we can link the we can make we can join the missing links that Moses is calling for, and I think that a better counter narrative to this thing is that what we are living through is not a story, it's nothing new. My ancestors, Kuntakin, they were traveling to Australia in the UK, where the modern capitalism we have was based on torture itself, and today trauma is used constructively so that Musa and I would lose many years. We have to solve that unnecessarily painful migrations and patterns that really you lose part of your youthful and this leads to generational fires. Who can solve this? I think politicians who have this enormous power that we give those prisons that you are calling are here existing everywhere. When I get down, when I look from my floor here, I, I, I used to see quarantine ships during the quarantine. Those are brothers there from generations that they could benefit. So when we look at these interconnections, that the world is a capitalist village, that me, when I was working in the agricultural sector, in fact, I shared with you a policy brief on the syndemic vulnerability, because we cannot see just vulnerability as one thing. It's just vulnerable here. No, it's a perpetual vulnerability. And until we see all these interconnections together, we, will, we cannot treat the, the symptoms of the system and leaving all the causes there. No, we have to treat the whole system itself. We have to annihilate what is going on. It's perpetually injustice. And this week, we wouldn't arrive at a solution. And I believe that this message should be hard to the politicians, but they have to work. We all have to work much more spiritually. Thank you. Um. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, you've touched us all by, by what you have been just telling us about. Um, the reflection comes to mind yet again that there's so much burden placed on people who have refugee experience or indeed who have, and this is all of the speakers here today, who have actually witnessed the trauma, who have witnessed the, the, the experiences um, if they haven't lived through it themselves, they have borne witness to it. And we are very grateful to all of you for sharing that with us. But it's hard. It's hard. And for you to continue to talk about your experiences for refugees and people of refugee experience to still have to go up against the hard headed nastiness, um, the use of corrosive language to describe describe people in a way that is inhuman and in inhumane can be very tiring as well. And um, one of the questions um, that comes to mind when I'm, I'm listening to all of you um, in my, my position as, as chair and as director of Conrep is, is it's, it's hard, it's tiring for all of you to have to bear witness in this way and to have to talk of your own experience when we've got people um, in, in government and in other political parties who are not taking this on board. And so um, I have got uh, Pierre Luigi who himself is 
is going to uh, talk about a question, is going to ask a question himself, but we always, you know, the comment has been made by Claire in a comment to me, that refugees speak about their suffering, and this is a way of, in a sense, continuing a, a type of, you know, narrative which can see refugees as victims, whereas we see them as agents as well, but they still are, are dealing with the challenge of these intransigent governments seeking electoral advantage. Um, so Pierluigi, I will hand over to you. Yes, thanks very much. I really appreciate also what you were saying about uh, this kind of uh, responsibility that we have in order to use certain kind of narratives and we is taking charge of the stories, right? Sarah was talking about the positionality, and if we think about the Mediterranean Sea, I was mentioning 2015, but then if we see the difference between when, for example, Mare Nostrum, the military humanitarian mission was in the Mediterranean, where uh, the, the militaries were uh, depicted as angels of the sea, like, right, like humanitarian uh, uh, social workers, but then um, again, the definition is political. So politics changed uh, and the atmosphere changed. So the angels of the sea became taxi for the migrants. And then as Sarah was saying, we were not only the, the saviors, but we were the one who were doing uh, uh, crimes of solidarity. So I really appreciate this, um, uh, this idea to uh, the border imaginaries through telling the stories. But I think that uh, the trauma, the stories, the injustice about the right to move uh, are also related to our uh, history or to our stories. I mean, Philomena, like Sarah, I don't know, Ben, but myself, we are migrants also, and we as... Uh, ethnic or uh, uh, national groups, uh, we have been migrants. I mean, especially Italians, there were 25 millions of migrants in the last century. And right now, there are more than five or six millions of Italians who emigrate out of Italy. It's a number that is higher than the numbers of foreigners who immigrate in Italy but the narrative is just about the invasion of migrants and not about us who have been or who are still migrants. So my question is about how can we kind of bridge this gap also telling our stories? I mean, because when Mostafa, when Alaji, and I agree that people who have refugee background, they have a lot of stories that can teach us, even as like academic people, because usually we do research and we kind of forgive to, to use emotions in our research, which are very important, the positionality. But how can we try to make a parallel between our stories, our history, and your stories and the actual history? What do you think is a way to decolonize also this kind of uh, uh, in, in mobility injustice? using our stories because otherwise the thing people uh, think that you know we were the one who were forced to migrate but we were different and we were not so different i mean like uh, i i heard uh, a rap song uh, of this guy say italians are with short memories talking about harlem and about the line of colors that du bois was denouncing saying that, you know, Italians became white. And the same in Australia, Italians became white. They were not recognized as white. So do you think there is a way to, to, to make a link, a connection between these two different and similar stories in order to produce an impact nowadays? Pierluigi, to whom are you addressing that question? To everyone, I think, mainly to Alaji and Mostafa, but if Ben and Sarah want to jump up. 
please. All right. Um, given that we have um, little time left, and thank you very much for your comments and your question, um, I could, I'd like to ask for um, uh, Alaji and Moz to do the impossible, and that is to try and respond in about one minute each. And then Ben and Sarah, if you would like to come in for about another minute maximum as well. I'm sorry for imposing this on you, but we do have to um, close soon. Alaji, are you happy to take this up um, first? Okay, yeah, because I, I, I have several identities. One of these identity is being Italian because my parents who, who gave me the hope that I lost are Italians. And today I have a 20 month baby girl who is born in Palermo here. So in this way, I think practical way, I think I am responding to the, to the, in a natural way, I'm responding to the question of inclusion and integration because my daughter is speaking Sicilian, Italian, English, and uh, my wife is Hungarian. So we have this, you know, many languages and is speaking to the Gambians here who are Mandinka. But also my parents used to tell me that uh, when they traveled from Sicily and just to, to Torino, they were, they were seen as from different part. And when I, when I was coming from the university crying because of the racism I faced in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the street, I come back home, they repeat their story, they use their story and tell me how they themselves underwent what I was undergoing, but being Sicilian and just in Torino or the, the other part of Italy. So I think that as professor was saying, using your own story to invite other people and to tell them that we have also faces in different ways. There are books like La Bella Gente, the good people. You know, Italians were used to be portrayed as the good people. So in that way, I call on Italian that maybe we are in fact the 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 the, the, the uh, we are from that ancestry where it where Italy has Italians has passed through whether in in in, uh, in, in Argentina in America. Uh, or, or in Australia. So it's the same paradigm that we can use to reflect back on our stories because when we know where we are coming from, we will know where we are and then we can be the architects of our own destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alaji. And again, I'm very sorry, Moz, to ask you to stick to about a minute or so. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Thank you so much for giving me this time. Um, there are a lot of uh, good things from the world that come to Australia, culturally, and culturally like uh, um, food, for example, Thai food, Vietnamese food, Lebanese food, and all from uh, background. And every food, for example, has uh, a, a lot of stories that how uh, this food is being cooked by these uh, parts of the world, for example, Lebanese, Vietnamese, and they bring it to uh, the people in Australia are eating this food and they enjoy it, they talk about the food. It's uh, it also good if uh, we have stories of the culture that this is not only food, there are a lot of good things in the culture that comes to this land. And uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, good, uh, the way we can change this sadness to uh, the way that uh, uh, refugees are not welcomed by the government is uh, to create a strong opposition uh, so that they talk about stories. They, uh, they talk about human rights. They, they accept that refugees are not illegal. When, when they look at me as a survivor, not illegal, then we see a lot of change. Because everyone, if, if I was not in danger, I wouldn't come to, to this land. Also other refugees. And everyone has different stories. Thank you very much for giving me this chance. Thank you very much, um, Moz. Um, Sarah, I'll give you mm, almost a minute. Yeah, I think uh, we, we should consider a few things here. Um, 
I mean, we talk a lot about this self-representation and uh, you know, the fact that we need to include this uh, collective action and the use of media visibility, this form of resistance, these voices that they are you know, uh, challenging this understanding of uh, you know, bare life and people that are stripped of their identity, their voices. But I think that the visibility for me is not enough, right? Uh, when we talk with the European leaders, when we talk with the policy maker, we need to bring the question of accountability. So I think uh, it's not just about reshaping the narrative and, you know, reformulate, rearticulate the question for rights and, uh, you know, the question for freedom of movement. But that's exactly what they are trying to do by denying us access to these places, denying us, us access as journalists, as researcher to, this, um, to these areas. Um, they want us to think and to build a different narrative that doesn't consider them as responsible because they give us access, right? Today, if you want to visit any refugee camp in the world, you need to have the authorization of the UN Refugees Agency, right? But I don't want to meet or to speak or to research anything um, that is related to refugee movement without questioning also the role of the United Nations. Because let's not forget that with, the, for example, the um, way that the policy are built and constructed within Libya, for example, or in other places in the world, with the Rwanda example, the UN is also involved. So if I want to um, research and question um, how this comes, how this area, how this uh, policy of control is being made, the UN is also part of the system of the architecture of power and, and responsibility. So uh, I think that's why we need to bring the question of accountability there and we need to question those um, those structure of power uh, built by humanitarian organization, built by politicians, built by you know Frontex and, and and border guards of the EU, and generate you know a new form of existence that is contesting this. Thank you so much. That contestation is so important. Thank you for that. And um, then has very kindly ceded um, his time because he knows that we are dealing with the clock. Um, it now uh, remains with me for me to just to thank you, our wonderful, wonderful speakers, to thank our discussant, to thank all of you who have come to attend this this evening. Um, it will be recorded, so please do feel free. It has been recorded, so it will be put up on our website. So feel free to tell your uh, friends and colleagues um, about it. I would like to take this opportunity to thank, um, uh, thank um, Sandra Lavenex and Claire uh, Lockman, Marguerite Matera, Nathan Gardner and Daniel Latkins and all of the people who have been working on Conrad for, on this event for so much um, time in the background. Thank you for being part of our community. Please continue to be part of our community. We want to be part of your community. Um, it has been a terrific um, pleasure and a great honour um, and a worrying honour um, to be part of this tonight. Um, thank you so much and please stay with us and to those of you attending, we are so delighted that you were able to join us. Thank you. Goodbye.